Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. Welcome to the Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. I'm Thomas Ricks, and this series is called Eight Questions That Should Be Asked About the LDS Church. Last time I talked about the LDS Church's position on... Um, the innocuous your supply of food and how uh, a well-meaning but fanatical person could potentially uh, deliberately provocate a famine um, and why the LDS Church needs to basically pass its preparations on to a third party to prevent the proverbial Chekhov's shotgun on the wall from happening. I don't think I'll be listened to, but that needs to happen. Today's podcast is um, basically about something that is supposedly apocryphal uh, called the dead, I'm sorry, not the dead, the white horse prophecy. Uh, The white horse prophecy was made in, supposedly, um, either 1839 or 1844, depending on which account you read. Uh, that Joseph Smith at one point said that the Constitution will hang by a thread and that an elder of the church will come riding on a white horse to save it. Um, There are some people who dispute this, and there are, uh, you know, there's a formal statement from the LDS Church that the particulars of this prophecy does not exist, But, um, specifically speaking, a number of LDS leaders definitely refer to the Constitution potentially hanging by a thread. One of the things you need to understand about LDS doctrine is that because um, there are a number of opportunities for potential revelation that were deliberately left there by Joseph Smith, or God, depending on your point of view, uh, such as the sealed LDS plates, or um, hidden revelations that supposedly come to light after the fact, or direct revelations that are supposedly given by God to the current LDS prophet, Um, or, for that matter, uh, books from past prophets that are either found, uh, in the case of uh, the Book of the Dead, which was translated by Joseph Smith to become the Book of Moses, or uh, that are received from pure air, like uh, the book of Abraham, Um, the fact of the matter is that um, LDS theology allows for apocryphal beliefs to be taken very seriously, primarily because of the fact that a faithful saint is not just supposed to follow scripture they are supposed to follow their definition of scripture is different than most churches Um, in a protestant church there's the bible and that's it in the catholic church there is um, something called tradition uh, and there's different words for it but basically it's the ecclesiastical tradition where they have things like the second vatican council papal tradition and then this the written scripture or a secondary um translation after that, in Judaism they have um, the uh, interpretations of the rabbi of the Torah and then the Torah itself. In the LDS Church it's much more complicated because the highest, most important scripture is what comes directly from the LDS current living prophet. So if the LDS prophet has a an official declaration with uh, the three members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve, then that pretty much overrides any previous scripture or any interpretation of scripture. And then there's degrees that come after that, including previous decrees by previous prophets that have the Quorum of the Twelve, uh, the the official canon scripture uh, of the LDS Church, which basically includes the Book of Mormon, the Old and New Testament, and something called the the Doctrine and Covenants, which are basically direct revelations received by Joseph Smith, supposedly, um, after he translated the Book of Mormon, as well as something called the Pearl of Great Price, which is essentially kind of an official uh, appendix or a, a apocrypha on top of the Doctrine and Covenants of uh, lost scripture, including uh, the Book of Abraham and the Book of Moses, as well as some other interesting things that he supposedly translated, as I mentioned. Um, 
the thing that you have to understand is that beneath this, it is considered scripture when they have something called General Conference, which they have twice a year. And basically, anything that's in that, that is not officially repudiated by the prophet, uh, is also considered scripture. Um, if your bishop gets up and gives a talk, that's also scripture. If um, they have a, a Sunday school manual or a priesthood manual or uh, an institute, which is uh, an informal uh, theology program they have, uh, all that, if approved by the church, is considered scripture. Now, there's a hierarchy to it, but the fact of the matter is that there are other lesser-known things that were also approved by the church, such as a very problematic thing for the church called the Journal of Discourses, where a lot of the early work of the church was recorded. And um, let's just say there's some very unusual things in this Journal of Discourses, including some things that are reviewed by most people today as extremely racist. But if you understand the LDS Church, you understand that something like the Journal of Discourses is scripture. It's not as important as scripture as the modern LDS prophet, but it is scripture nevertheless. So when you have as many channels uh, for revelation as the LDS Church has, on top of which you also have the ability to have personal revelation or um, to receive revelation for anybody that you have authority for. And what that means is, if, if, for example, you're in charge of an elders quorum inside a congregation of the LDS Church, you're entitled not only to receive revelation for yourself, but revelation for anybody in your that's under your command, essentially, as long as it doesn't contradict the scripture that's higher up the totem pole than you are. So y when you have this unique, very open channel for revelation, you have an open path for a lot of interpretation of what's going to happen. And so what that means is that when you have something that may or may not have been from Joseph Smith uh, called the White Horse Prophecy, where that means that the Constitution is going to be in peril and that the church is going to come in and save it, just like I mentioned in the last podcast of where you set up a situation where a well-meaning saint could easily be tempted to help prophecy along, you have a situation where even if the church officially reputes it, unless it reputes it widely and again and again and again, like they do with polygamy, um, there is no official declaration in the LDS church refuting the white horse prophecy the same way that there is an official declaration refuting plural marriage at this time. By the way, if you know anything about the LDS Church, you know it's that it's very much at this time that at some point plural marriage will be restored because Joseph Smith, when he received the revelation in the first place, wrote that it was essential for people to reach the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, which is to say that it is essential for a man to be able to have more than one wife for him to become like God. Just saying. So going back to my original point of the problems with the white horse prophecy is that I want you to understand a few things about the LDS church that people don't realize. The first one is that because of the way our federal system is set up and because of the way that the population of the LDS church is distributed, um, by having a heavy population president or presence in the Mountain West in Utah and Idaho and New Mexico, Arizona, and uh, to a lesser extent, Wyoming, Montana, and California, it means that you have an awful lot of Mormons and an awful lot of very sparsely, sparsely populated states. If you look at the percentage of uh, members of the LDS Church compared to the population versus the number of senators they have, you will find that there's essentially three times the representative representation in the Senate and in the House uh, for members of the LDS Church by denomination uh, than there is to anything else. Now, if you ask your average member of the LDS Church, they would say God inspired the Constitution, and so therefore God, that's exactly what God meant, or at least that this, that's what the founders meant, and that geographical power is more important than true democracy. Um, this is not a podcast about politics. I'll be doing that uh, in my own good time. But be that as it may, you must definitely at the least understand and acknowledge that the LDS Church has a much bigger footprint, person for person, in terms of political influence in the, in, in the United States. Um, in the 1960s, on the election of John F. Kennedy, 
people were obsessed, obsessed with the election of Kennedy because he was the first Catholic president and they were worried that he was going to make this a Catholic country and that he would be answerable to um, the Pope and that uh, John Kennedy, uh, in order to uh, avert this concern, made a very famous speech in which he said that he is an American first and a Catholic second, and uh, he assuaged many concerns and it went on to be uh, what is, at least for now, acknowledged by both sides as a great president. I think we can at least say that um, the people on the right uh, give token acknowledgement to Kennedy because when they're talking about a good Democrat, certainly Kennedy is the first at their list. Um, it, it helps that he's you know dead and can't dispute uh, their interpretation of what Kennedy would think of one of their talking points. But nevertheless, um, Kennedy is typically, at least by lip service, acknowledged as a great president. And so now we come to one of my favorite punching bags, and I will admit uh, to great personal bias in this case, and that is Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney is, to me, the personification of the abuse uh, inside the church or at least by members of the church, of this dead, I mean, sorry, this white horse prophecy. I, I know I keep saying dead white horse, but the truth is is that I have an email address called dead white horse at, and I'm not going to say what, but um, that's my personal email. And, and it's because I, I truly believe that if we can get the Romneys out of politics, then we might finally be able to um, end this nonsense about uh, the, the uh, white horse prophecy. So the... Political presidency of Mitt Romney is not, nor have I ever claimed, the official policy of the LDS Church. So I want to get that out right off the bat. I am in no way, shape, or form claiming that the LDS Church officially backs the Romney family or officially wants Mitt Romney to be president. Having said that, um, I think it's time to acknowledge what is for me personally a pretty big deal, which was... Um, April 26, 2007, that might not be a big deal to me, to most people, but for me, it was actually the impetus that finally caused me to leave the Mormon church. On April 26, 2007, Mitt, uh, Dick Cheney was invited to speak at, um, the, at Brigham Young University as a political speaker uh, and address the country. Uh, this isn't by itself such a big deal. There have been a lot of non-Mormon speakers who speak uh, at Brigham Young commencement. But this one was unusual in that um, nobody, but nobody could ignore the fact that the first, the, the three members of the first quorum of the presidency, which is basically the top three leaders of the Mormon church, all attended this. Now, later on, um, in the interest of being supposedly nonpartisan, uh, Harold uh, Reid, who was the majority leader of the Senate for a long time, was also invited. But I contrast this by the fact that the members of the first presidency did not attend when he spoke. Um, what does this have to do with Mitt Romney, you ask? Well, uh, good question. It is my personal belief that... Um, the members of the LDS Church were considering their relationship with the uh, Republican Party in late 2006 with the Iraq War going very, very badly. And there were some hints uh, by the president at the time, President Hinckley, as such. And the Republican Party realized that the LDS Church is one of their most important constituencies. And so they knew that Mitt Romney really, really wanted to be president. And so a quiet deal was made between the Romney family and the Bush family for Romney to become the heir apparent in the uh, presidential race. Uh, and if you look at the 2008 race and even the 2012 race, uh, Mitt Romney was definitely... Uh, had the support of the Bush family and had the support of the the machinery of the Republican Party. Now you can call it conspiracy, you can call it a coincidence as much as you like, um, and that's entirely up to you. But I know two things very well. I know the LDS Church very well, and I know politics very well. And I'm telling you that 
a deal was made between the Romneys and the Bush family that um, they were going to get what they needed. And as a way of making that happen, strings were pulled and Dick Cheney was asked to speak. Now, the exact particulars of how that went down, I can't tell you. But the fact is, is that a war criminal, an unindicted war criminal, who violated the International Treaty of Torture, Dick Cheney, spoke at BYU, received an honorary degree, was honored by the presence of the leadership of the LDS Church, and lo and behold, a year later, Mitt Romney is the official candidate of the LDS Church. I'm sorry, official candidate of the Republican Party. Another um, interesting element that I want to add to um, the history of politics in the LDS Church, and it's, it's long and complicated, and if you really want to understand it, I highly recommend reading a book called Hierarchies of Power, um, Part 1 and Part 2, which talk in great detail about the secular history of the LDS Church or the, sorry, the secular history of the leadership of the LDS Church, but the, the summary I'm going to give you is point one, Joseph Smith ran for president of the United States. Most people don't realize this, but in large part he did it because when the Mormons were being persecuted, literally tortured and chased by mobs from state to state, they appealed to the federal government, and the federal government, including the president at the time, basically said, screw you. So Joseph felt that to preserve his religion and his family and his church, he had to take matters into his own hands. And he was a roll up your sleeves and go and get at him. You know, say what you want about Joseph Smith. He never has never shied away for a fight. He he would leap right in and, and make it happen. So when he figured out that the federal government wasn't going to help him, he ran for president on a platform that included, among other things, freeing the slaves which was probably ultimately one of the things that contributed to his assassination. A lot of people didn't really give a crap about Joseph Smith until he started talking about freeing the slaves. And it was a very big deal in Missouri, and it was also even a big deal in Illinois. Um, so that ultimately contributed to his death. Later, um, the LDS Church, when it was in the territory of Mexico and was establishing Utah, the LDS Church was essentially a theocracy, a democratic theocracy, but make no mistake about it, the LDS Church officially was the secular authority of the territory until the United States government went on, and there was a lot of friction between the church and the United States government for a couple of decades until they basically had that decree of polygamy. Um, and for a while, the church was so angry about it that they officially uh, made some people Democrats and some people Republicans, but over time, because the LDS Church is a gerontocracy, and because the Republican Party is naturally conservative, over time, the more time passed, the LDS Church became more and more staunchly Republican, firmly and finally becoming totally Republican when President Ezra Taft Benson, who was a cabinet member to um, Dwight Eisenhower and the Secretary of Agriculture, who, by the way, was the Secretary of Agriculture while a sitting apostle. That's never happened in the church or United States history before or since. Um, in fact, to the best of my knowledge, no cabinet member of any presidency in the history of the Republic besides Eisenhower had a standing major um, ecclesiastical leader as a cabinet member. Um, so there's that interesting fact. Um, but once Benson became a uh, prophet, the LDS Church took a very sharp turn to the right. Now, some of this I'm going to be addressing in my final two episodes um, after this one. But in terms of politics, it's just worthwhile to note that um, once ben Benson became president, the, any question of neutrality uh, at a practical level in the culture of the LDS Church is gone. Officially, the LDS Church is still totally nonpartisan. Um, there are actual Democrats in the uh, Quorum of the Twelve, but uh, pound for pound, uh, you just have to look at the statistics for voting patterns in Utah and other mountain states, and by and large, if you're a Mormon, you're going to probably be a Republican. Um, now, I do want to throw one thing out there to their credit. As I said before, uh, initially the, Republic, the Mormon Republicans staunchly rejected Trump, but over time, um, because they are a very practical people and also, quite frankly, a bit of a flip-flopping people, um, they now might not like Trump, but they pretty much back him. And you look at approval numbers in Mormon states, and uh, they are now firmly in the camp of Trump. Okay, so 
this goes back to Mitt Romney because the the fact of the matter is is that Mitt Romney is a problem because Mitt Romney, in my opinion, and we're now reaching my first true conspiracy theory for this, but hear me out. In the LDS Church, I've talked to you about the concept of a patriarchal blessing, or a, essentially a personal horoscope or a personal revelation, where a special priesthood representative called a patriarch puts his hand on your head and gives you personalized instructions or scripture directly from God, uh, personalized to you about how you should live your life. And in these uh, blessings, they will declare you what tribe of Israel that you're supposed to be a member of. But in the old days, uh, lots of interesting things would sometimes make their way into these blessings, such as, you know, you will serve on a mission in this place, or you will do this thing. Um, there are certain things that patriarchs these days are discouraged from doing, but and we don't have access to a lot of these blessings because they're kept under lock and key, and the only person who's supposed to have access to them is you and maybe your descendants. Well, knowing that these exist, and knowing there's one other interesting fact about Mitt Romney I want you to know. Mitt Romney's grandfather, Marion G. Romney, was a member of the First Presidency. There are lots of very prominent Mormon candidates, like I said, Harry Reid, John Hunter, or Huntsman, um, you know, lots of people who are Mormon have run for political office, including the office of president. But not lots of people have as close a tie to the, L the ruling families of the LDS Church as Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney's great-grandfather lived in Mexico. There was a subsect of the LDS Church that went down to Mexico after the original um, and by Mexico, I mean actual Mexico, not Mexico that we stole from Mexico, uh, went down south of the border so that they could continue to live polygamy because of the persecution of the federal government on the Utah territories. Mitt Romney's uh, great-grandfather was among these. In fact, Mitt Romney's grandfather was actually born in Mexico, even though he did not spend most of his time there. It is my belief that either... Mitt Romney, or Mitt Romney's father, or Mitt Romney's grandfather, somewhere in their patriarchal blessing, received either a direct prophecy, like you will be the inheritor of the white horse prophecy, or some clause that hints at it, like you will be a political leader, or you and your descendants will have great political power or be needed in the political service. The reason I say that is because Mitt Romney's grandfather, I mean, Mitt Romney's father was not only the governor of Michigan, but also ran for president and failed. Mitt Romney is running for president. And if you look closely at what the Romney family is doing, it becomes obvious that um, he, his sons are being groomed for the same thing. Um, while it might be the official position of the LDS church that they don't support the white horse prophecy, if you look at the actions of many members of the leadership of the LDS Church, the Romneys are well known to the families that make up the majority of the ruling quorum of the Twelfth. Um, there has to be a reason why the Church is so accommodating to the Romney family. And I'm sorry, I don't believe that it's because Rick Romney is such a great guy. Um, I have known personally... Uh, family members who behave in such a reprehensible fashion that, quite frankly, if you're not in love with him or a personal fan of Romney or the church, most people who I know of this individual find him kind of creepy. Um, I know for a fact that he has definitely acted in a very unchristlike fashion to me directly. Um, and, you know, if these are the kinds of people who associate and who are apparently on a first name basis with Mitt Romney, then I think we can at least agree that, um, look, let's just look at Mitt Romney's political beliefs. People do change politically, but Mitt Romney, to become the governor of Massachusetts, said all kinds of moderate things that somehow remarkably changed once he decided to run for president in 2012, and Mitt Romney was one of the lead um, critics of uh, Donald Trump 
uh, in 2016 when the entire establishment of uh, the LDS Church went against him, and yet just like the craven senatorial candidate from Texas, Ted Cruz, has suddenly become the biggest fan of Trump in the world, even though Trump said that his father tried to kill Ted Kennedy and that his w and insulted his wife, suddenly Ted Cruz, because he's losing, thinks that Trump, Trump is the best thing since sliced bread. Mitt Romney, who is now the senatorial candidate for uh, Utah, who could be leading the charge uh, against the crap that Trump is doing right now, um, it has not said one word to criticize the current president. In fact, um, the craven l human lizard that is Rick Scott, who is the governor of Calif uh, governor of my state, Florida, and the uh, other craven Republican, uh, fairly racist candidate for Republican governor, uh, have both actually criticized a statement Trump made recently about uh, the deaths caused by the hurricane last year because there's a lot of Puerto Ricans in this state. So they had to put some distance between themselves and Trump. Uh, they have actually, both of them are totally craven individuals who, quite frankly, there is plenty of evidence to actually engage in criminal prosecution if we had uh, an attorney general in this state who wasn't a Republican. And they've done it, but Mitt Romney, who is supposedly so close to the leadership of the LDS Church and so closely admired by most active Latter-day Saints, uh, that he can't criticize the most craven and disgusting president we've had in a long time. I want to tell you something about LDS culture. I'm not talking about the LDS Church because there are many, as I've said repeatedly, there are a lot of very good Christian, holy good members of the LDS Church who follow not only the proper LDS doctrine, but also the doctrine of Christ. But having been a member of the LDS Church, I can tell you that the culture of the church itself is very craven and very insular. And if you are a popular Mormon, Mormons like you because Mormons want to be popular and they know their religion is a little bit weird. And so if you're a Mormon celebrity, unless you're doing things that are against the teachings of the church, they are going to cut you a lot of slack and they're going to talk a lot of say a lot of positive things about you. And you can make the argument that other cultures do that, too. But um, other cultures don't claim to be the sole church of Jesus Christ. So there's that. And on top of that, quite frankly, um, here's the last thing I want to add before I end this podcast. I want you to understand that when he was creating the FBI, its founder reached out to Mormons because he believed them to be honest and ethical. And while for the most part they are, of course, they're, they're certainly willing to lie for their church or they're willing to lie when it's convenient. But for the most part, I will flat out admit, even Republican members of the LDS Church are, by and large, honest as long as it's not about their political beliefs. So I agree. I understand why um, Hoover wanted to recruit them. Also understand that because so many of them are Mormons or missionaries and go around the world and acquire fluency and uh, languages from all over the world as a result, there are also a very large number of uh, Mormon members in the CIA or the NSA. There are very practical reasons for this. Also, um, to be frank, um, there are several LDS scriptures that, um, well, that make it such that while the church does not officially worship government, um, it is indirectly considered a holy thing and that God has a direct hand in who does or does not head a government and that they are responsible. But the point is, is that LDS saints in any government that they find themselves are supposed to support their government. And uh, they do this because um, this revelation originally came, quite frankly, because they were persecuted and it was meant to be a talking point against that part persecution, but they still have maintained that in their culture such that um, 
it doesn't matter if you're a dictatorship or your democracy, if you're a faithful saint in whatever country you find yourself, you're supposed to be loyal to that government. And at a practical level, that means in our current government, um, you are much more likely to get a security clearance because you could be trusted by the federal government. At one point in the 1980s, there was something called the Mormon Mafia, where Mormons were basically uh, promoting members inside the FBI uh, inappropriately because they were Mormon. And while that, that practice has since stopped, make no mistake, pound for pound, just like in the Senate and in the Congress, um, there are more Mormons in our supposedly deep state apparatus than there are in... Uh, than there are other people of other faiths. And at a practical level, you have to ask yourself if even a fraction of them believe in something like the deep horse or the, 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 um, the white horse prophecy, how many of them are going to be willing to quietly support uh, somebody like Mitt Romney? Uh, let's just say, if you pay close attention to the news, there are an awful lot of leaks that uh, quietly help uh, people like Mitt Romney. Just saying. This has been the Tossing Grenades at Windmills podcast. Buy my book, Have Name Will Travel, available in many markets, including at Amazon.com. Copyright 2018, Red Anvil Amalgamated, LLC. To fight the forces of evil!